Okay. Good morning. Um, my name is Mark, one of the pastors here. Before we do anything that we're supposed to do, I'd like to do something else. I discovered something just this morning. It's in, it's, the words are not on the screen. They're in the small black hymnal, uh, The Faith We Sing. I'm going to invite you to turn to hymn number 2183. 2183. <clears throat> and I'm surprised I haven't seen this before, but um, I'd like us to sing it before I say good morning. It's, um, it can set the tone for what we want to do today as we worship God, as we acknowledge the presence of Jesus with us, and as we uh, push ourselves. It's called Unsettled World, number 2183, and you can just stay seated. I'd like us to sing it. it it's pretty simple, and, um, but be attentive to what it says. It goes like this. Sing it. Unsettled world where people long to find their way to feel secure. From lives of turbulence and rush, we come to seek your peace, our God. Your word to hear, our faith to live. Unsettled world where money rules and greedy systems call the tune. From strength to keep our values straight, we come with trust in you, O oh God. Your word to hear, our faith to live. Unsettled world where angry poor from grinding need and affluence stare. With tears and thirst for truth and right, we come with longing in our hearts. Your word to hear, our faith to live. Unsettled world, unsettled church, whose structures creak and doctrines swirl. By faith and in the strength of Christ, we strive in true community. Your word to hear, our faith to live. What do you think? Huh? It's a keeper. I think that's my new 10th favorite hymn. Yeah, it's a great hymn. Can't believe I didn't see that ever before till just this morning. Welcome. Good morning. My name is Mark. I'm one of the pastors along with Pastor Rachel. We're glad you're with us on this day that feels like autumn. Um, it's not, not half bad. These blue um, slips of paper are in the pews. If there's something or someone for whom you'd like us to pray today, feel free to jot it down. We don't need a lot of information, a first name, whether we're praying for healing or some celebration. And you'll notice um, on the cards, there's a box for you to check if you'd like us to send a prayer letter. Our tradition in the church is <clears throat> when asked, we send letters to people to let them know that they've been held in prayer during our worship service. You don't need to know this person to sign the letter. The letters will be at the back of the church on that counter, and we invite everyone to put your name on the letters if there are any there. And um, these prayer concerns, you can bring them forward as we sing our opening hymn or pray the, the psalm prayer. Just drop them in this basket, all right? And we will... Uh, lift them up in prayer later in the service. And the other thing we invite you to do is to look at these um, books along the center aisle. Let us know you're here. It's not required. We don't require attendance, but if you let us know you're here and then pass those books along, if you're visiting and you want more information, we'll be happy to get that to you. Uh, if you're a regular attender and your email address or your physical address or your phone number 
or your hair color or something changes, uh, let us know to, so we can keep our records up to date. So I think those are the two announcements that I need to share as we begin to worship. Um, uh, Sunday school is going to happen today. Um, hey, welcome. <laughs> and so shall I tell them where now or should I wait? Okay, so for the older kids, godly play uh, in the Reed Booth room, right out the door and up the hallway. No, that's the younger kids, the younger kids. The older class is uh, downstairs in the Rainbow Room, and it's pretty obvious which room that is, if, if you don't know, but Rachel will also be leading folks there. That's after the children's message this morning. Um, Adam, I'd like you to put that slide up for us. There are three things that I'm going to ask you to work with me today, three things as we delve into the book of James. First, do we underestimate the influence of our historical prejudices? Second, are we aware of the theological justifications used to support those prejudices? Third, and perhaps most important, from what and or from whom must we be liberated in order to be truly free? That sets the tone for the work that we have to do. Liturgy means work. You'll see this screen again in a, a few moments as we head into the message. But first, let's sing. We're talking about freedom, what it means to be free, to let others be free. It's hymn number 2194 in the small black hymnals, The Faith We Sing, or the words will also be on the screen. Let me play an introduction, we'll stand, and let's sing it together.
would please join me in the prayer psalm, which is Psalm 40, 146. It can be found in the red hymnal on page 858 and 859, or will be on the screen. I'll read the light print, and I ask you to please join me for the darker print. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have been. Put not your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. Their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, and who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners and upholds the widow and the orphan. But the Lord brings the way of the wicked to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, from generation to generation. Praise, Praise the Lord. there are any children who want to come forward, I have a story I want to tell you. You can sit right up here. You don't have to come. You can stay right where you are. If you'd like to come forward, you can. I'm going to tell you a true story about something that happened to me about the time I was Ruby's age. Right over here. Ruby, what grade are you in? Perfect. Hi, Catherine. Have a seat. This is a true story. Hello, Jaya. Hi, Janet. This is a true story that changed my life. Um, but before I tell you the story, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been told that you can't do something you want to do? Yeah. Probably all of us, we've been told that we can't do something we want to do. So I was about Ruby's age. I think I was in sixth grade. I might have been going into seventh, but right, maybe I was in fifth grade. Around that time of my life, some friends and I decided we were going to sleep out. Where I lived, we had like a patio over the garage. It didn't have a, uh, no roof over it, but there were walls around it, so it was sort of, it was safe, uh, but we were outdoors. We could look up and um, through the trees and, if, and see the stars, and every now and then we'd sleep out. Well, this one night, we slept out, and uh, when, when I would sleep out with my friends, we didn't get much sleep. We got very little sleep, actually. Not unlike when, you know, if you have friends over to sleep at your house, or if the cousins come over, like when, when our family's together and all the cousins, the five cousins are there, they don't really, it's a disaster in terms of sleep. But anyway, so next morning the sun comes up and in a rare moment of total parental abdication of responsibility, I don't know where my mother was, but we got to have whatever we wanted for breakfast. And so let me tell you what I had, and this changed my life forever. I had a large piece of chocolate layer cake, two, two levels of frosting, and a tall glass of Kool-Aid. <laughs> and um, about, I, I don't, I mean, my mother, Julie, I don't know where Julie was, but boy, she really, anyway, about an hour later, my friends had gone home, and I was the fourth sickest that I've ever been in my life. There are only three times in my whole life I've been sicker than I was then. Now, I learned a lesson. The lesson I learned is, and I, I mean, I've never forgotten this. The lesson I learned is that sometimes what I want is not good. Sometimes what I want 
is not good. Sometimes what I need to be set free from are the things I want. Let me tell you something else that happened. Since that day in 19, I don't know, 50, 1961 or 62, whenever it was, since that day, I have not had one <laughs> drop of Kool-Aid. <laughs> Just saying the word makes me uncomfortable. I don't know why that didn't happen with chocolate cake. I can eat chocolate cake till there's no tomorrow. But I cannot drink. I have not had one drop of Kool-Aid. I don't, do they sell Kool-Aid anymore? Oh, see what I'm saying? I mean, I am so Kool-Aid averse that if I'm in a grocery store and, and, and I'm walking by the Kool-Aid, I must not see it. I, go, nah, 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 nah. I don't even look at it. So this is a lesson that I want to share with you. Maybe there are times in your life when the very thing you need to be set free from are the things you want. I'd like you to remember that. And I'd like to just close by saying one thing. There's a guy in the Bible whose name is Paul, and in one place in the Bible he says, a couple things about himself. Sometimes he says, the things I want to do are the things that I don't do. And the things I don't want to do are the things that I do. And I'd like to add, sometimes the things I want to do are the things I shouldn't. Let's pray together. God, thank you for all the choices we have. Some of us have more choices than we know what to do with. Help us to remember every day to choose you. And to remember that there are times when what we want might not be the best thing for us. To listen to the people who love us and care about us and teach us. And, and to remember that sometimes the very thing we need to be free from is ourselves. Bless these children. Bless us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Rachel, you're going to lead the charge, right? Thank you. Our scripture is from James, from the second chapter, verses 1 through 17. Um, you can join me in, and read along in the Pew Bible on page 229 and 230. This part is, is um, titled, Warning Against Partiality. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there, or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith? and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Adam, can I put that slide back up with those three points? This is, um, I'm going to invite you to work with me, stay with me as we explore briefly these points. Do we underestimate the influence of our historical prejudices? Are we aware of the theological justifications used to support those prejudices? And from what and from whom must we be liberated in order to be truly free? There are two lines from James that I'm thinking about. One has to do with this no notion that we are judged by the law of liberty. What does it mean to be judged by the law of liberty or freedom? And the other line from James that, that I think is connected to that is faith without works is dead. We might want to explore at some point, what are works without faith? Is there a problem there? But before we do the work, let's just take a moment and see something that I thought was comical. So let's put this slide on. I'll let you read it. <laughs> it's free. It's free. My, mo my mother used to say as a way of, uh, we done with this? I think, yeah, thanks. <laughs> my mother used to say, as a way of trying to uh, um, impose a heavy dose of morality on us, there's a price ticket for all your good times. There's a price ticket for all your good times. Hey, Mom, I'm going out. Okay, just remember there's a price ticket for all your good times. I want to review a little history as, as we deal with this text. One of the things that our founders managed to do it, the founders of this country, was to convince a majority of the colonists that they should fight for their freedom, for their liberty, weary of being taxed without being represented. They sought and they fought to free themselves from what they believed to be was a tyrannical government and system. And against mighty odds, the ragtag fought to victory. But having won the military freedom, they now had to do the far more tedious work of defining with some precision what does it mean to be free? What is that going to look like for us and for our nation? And not only what did it mean, but who was it for? For whom was this freedom? This was far more complicated than the military endeavors that they had just achieved. 
One of the things written into the fabric of the American mindset was the need to ensure the liberties of the minority, right? In his epistle, James notes the fact that it's the wealthy, read the powerful, who are most likely to oppress. And when the powerful can persuade the majority to their own way, right, then the minority are often trampled upon. In 2012, 0.01% of the U.S. population gave more than 25% of the monies disclosed as political donations. 0.01% gave over 25%. Who has the financial means to influence the outcome of our elections and the course of our politics and, and <laughs> therefore to affect uh, our life together, how we are living in community? Well, the founders wanted to ensure that no one is forced to live or worship in one state-sanctioned way. So the Amish don't have to use electricity. We're not going to force them to use electricity. Jehovah's Witnesses cannot be forced to salute the flag. That was a right that was upheld by a, su a Supreme Court decision in 1943. To force people to, believe, to behave or believe in ways or things that violate their convictions would also violate their right to free speech or their right to silence, their right not to say anything. In, in our recent history, Two of our presidents were elected, though they did not win the popular vote. George Bush had half a million fewer votes than Al Gore. Donald Trump had almost three million votes fewer than Hillary Clinton. The Electoral College was the founder's way of trying to ensure the voice of the less populated states could be heard. A minority has both the freedom and the power to elect our president. As intentional as the Jeffersons and the Adams and the Madisons were, the fact is they did not truly intend freedom for all. This is obvious as early as Section 2 of Article 1 in our Constitution where a distinction is made between free persons and others who will be counted as three-fifths of a person. This, of course, refers to the African slaves. And as for those they called the Indians, the people who were here in the first place, they were summarily dismissed. They didn't count. Now, I know these were politically motivated concessions, which, had they not been enacted, our nation would have been dead in the water. I also know that amendments have been made in an attempt to walk back the explicit prejudice, privilege, and racism of the day. But the fact remains that from the starting line, our nation's moral credibility is compromised. And the all, in the phrase, all men are created equal, even accounting for the gender <laughs> preference, we must acknowledge with regard to all, well, maybe that did not mean what they thought it meant. What we professed and what we did were glaringly inconsistent. Now, a moment ago, we heard faith without works is dead. Jesus had no qualms in calling people who said one thing and did another thing. What did he call them? Hypocrites. The various amendments notwithstanding, once injustice is rationally and politically legitimized, it continues to live in the individual and the collective consciousness of the people. Prejudice, privilege, and racism retain their unholy influence in our culture. And let me ask you this. Has anybody ever said anything to you for which they apologized, but which you have never forgotten? What is the power of the word once it's expressed? I mean, you can go back and say what I really meant was, but that doesn't undo the fact you said it. I may have shared the story with you when I was a, 
pastor in a rural community. One time I went on a visit and um, went up to a man and, and uh, he was a farmer. He was working and uh, went up and he extended his hand as we introduced ourselves and I shook his hand and after I shook his hand, I looked at my hand. You're grimacing. Now that happened 30 years ago. I've never forgotten it and I've never done it again. The damage was done. I mean, he saw me. So what we say and what we do, even if we apologize, even if it's not what we meant or what we intended, once it's said or done, it can't be walked back. Prejudice, privilege, and racism retain their unholy influence in our culture. That's what I'm trying to say, that it's in our DNA. And we have to acknowledge it. I am so grateful to be a citizen of this land. I mean, the freedoms that we enjoy are myriad. I am blessed. And I, I believe we all are blessed to live in this land. So I'm not here to badmouth it, but I am here to remind us of another allegiance. What we would say is a greater allegiance. We have to explore our faith and what it says about liberty. When James says in his apostle, in his epistle, excuse me, always speak and act as people destined for judgment under the law of freedom. What is he saying? We might say, well, what he really meant was to live free from the law, be free from the law, but that's not what he said. The law, as Christians understand it, is one of unconditional love. So we don't love on the condition that you're wealthy or attractive or powerful. In fact, we don't even love on the condition that you have the capacity to love me back. We love as St. John writes so eloquently because God first loved us. We love because we're loved. The greatest thing is to love God and to love our neighbor. The freedom we enjoy as Christians is the freedom from any encumbrance to love. Anything that prevents us from loving, we're free from that. That's the law by which we're judged. And that's the law we're called to fulfill. And that is not an easy law. <laughs> but just as our nation's constitution forces us to examine our political hypocrisy, the Bible exposes our theological duplicity. The land of our nation was discovered on the early tides of European exploration and conquest. Our nation was birthed on the crest of that wave, fully supported by an undercurrent of purported divine providence. Manifest destiny. God's will in part as a response to the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century and in part because of the emerging intellectualism that, resented, or that resulted from the uh, printing press, theology took on new importance and an invigorated influence in the affairs of our state. So along with Columbus and Cortez, the Sandovals and Pizarros, Vasco da Gama, Ferdinand Magellan, we have to acknowledge a lesser known personage, somebody that I hadn't heard to until I heard of until I'd done some reading recently. An individual whose intellect was matched only by the intensity of his faith and his capacity as a prolific writer. He provided the theological fuel that kept the fires of greed and profit and conquest burning hot during the colonial era. His name is Jose de Acosta. Jose de Acosta. I never heard of him. Born in 1540 in Spain, he was a Jesuit priest and a theologian. He was a sickly man whose physical ailments perhaps provided him little recourse for entertainment other than to read and pray and think and write. We don't have time to examine all of his influence in depth, but let me share a couple key concepts. The first is this. 
While Jose de Acosta celebrated the hand of God in leading the bands of explorers to the rich lands of the New World, he remained completely ignorant and disinterested in the possibility that God was also with the native peoples who were being conquered. We must not underestimate the power of this selective anthropology that's written not just into our politic, but into our religion. De Acosta proclaimed the compass was an exquisite theological improvisation. God gave us the compass. This was a tool given to explorers by which God enabled us to feel comfortable and confident as we situated ourselves in foreign lands, in other people's backyards. De Acosta dismisses the native peoples, and I'm writing a direct quote. It's not very important to know what the Indians, we're talking now about South American natives, not very important to know what the Indians themselves are wont to tell of their beginnings and origin for what they relate resembles dreams rather than history. Figments of their imagination. Dr. Willie James Jennings discusses one of de Acosta's most famous analogies. It's the ugly daughter analogy. The wisdom of God, writes de Acosta, is demonstrated in the Lord's having placed the greatest number of mines, we're talking gold, tin, copper, the greatest number of mines that ever existed in lands inhabited by the most uncivilized people for the purpose of inviting men to seek out and possess those lands and coincidentally communicate their religion. These lands were made for us, not for the people who live there. This is God-ordained. De Acosta goes on to write, In this regard, a wise man once said that what a man does to marry off an ugly daughter is give her a large dowry. This is what God has done, he writes, with that rugged land, endowing it with great wealth in mind so that whoever wished could find it by this means. This is in the theological underpinnings of the colonial era. These writings of Jose de Acosta were widely distributed, translated into multiple languages, and some tout him as among the most influential of theologians in the 16th century. And you ask yourself, I ask myself as a pastor, how is it I never heard of this guy? Well, how many people in history didn't you hear about when you were in 7th or 8th grade? that only later comes to life. How many people in your family <laughs> didn't you learn about until you were 60? And some elder said, oh, by the way, Aunt Tilly, we never talked about her. This, this is our theological mooring. Does it matter? Boy, I'm, I'm asking a lot of you unapologetically. <laughs> it's important for us to recognize and take seriously the realities of our political and spiritual assumptions. How many times does the Bible go back in history and say, remember, remember, this happened. Why? Well, maybe we sinned. Remember, this, maybe this is why this happened. How many times do we go back in the scriptures and have to be reminded in, in fact, Jesus of Nazareth, I mean, the reason that we say he is the prophet and the Christ, the Messiah, is because we go back in that history and we look for all the things that we believe he fulfilled. We're always going back, trying to find justification for who we are and what we do, right? It's important for us to recognize and take seriously these assumptions, where they come from, and how deeply embedded they are, not just in our individual, but in our collective consciousness. James is on to something when he tells us by what measure we will be judged. He's bringing us back to that ancient law which nobody can fulfill. I mean, if you violate one jot or tittle of that law, you violate the whole thing. He brings us back trying to embed in us, in our consciousness, the impossibility of living 
faithfully by the law and then telling us that we're free from it. But free to do what? Free to be what? Any inkling of partiality violates the law. My goodness, when I shook that man's hand and looked at my own, I might as well have murdered someone, right? When you said it and immediately knew you shouldn't have, you might as well have murdered someone. I mean, you can walk it back till the cows come home, but you can't undo that you said it. James is trying to place upon us the burden of that and then help us to experience the joy and the, and the privilege and the ecstasy of being free. Free from that. That's what Jesus accomplishes. He is sounding the warning bell intended to get and keep our attention. What we say, who we are, and who we say we're following, what we say we believe, that has to be played out in our lives. And that's why forgiveness is so important, because you're going to have to forgive me before church is over, because I'm going to screw it up, aren't I? I mean, before we walk out the door, you might walk so by somebody who thinks you're ignoring them. <laughs> James is sounding this warning. The challenge is to keep before us this question. From what do we have to be liberated? God, what do you need to set me free from today so I can live in freedom? Free from my prejudice, free from... My, my selfishness, free from my greed and free from my pride and free from having to have my own way. God, I want to have my own way. How can I get free from that? Jesus, oh, freedom, set me free. Jesus poses the same question. What do you need to be free from? What needs to happen so you can experience the kingdom of God? The power of God's spirit. What do you need to be liberated from? What opinions do you have? What, what convictions do you have that you're so sure of, so sure of, that you need to let go? What are they? But when Jesus asks the question, there's this caveat. He says, I can help you with this. Faith in me helps you with this. Because it doesn't just keep sounding the warning bell, but it assures you you're forgiven. So maybe I've never forgotten it. But I've never done it again. And I've never forgotten that man. And so... The memory lingers, but I'm free. Thank God. Thank God Almighty, I'm free of that. And actually, as I shared with the children, what I'm really saying, what James is saying, what Jesus is saying, what Jesus lived for and died for, what Jesus demonstrated when he came letting go of any divine prerogatives, letting go of, of any um, privilege, <laughs> becoming fully human, what Jesus is saying is, you need to be free from yourself. The thing that shackles us is us. A church that can't move on in a couple, a husband or wife, a partner who can't let go, a child who spends their whole life blaming their parents. It's, it's me. I, I don't have to get over you people. 
You people can't shackle me. I do that all by myself. And so, Jesus, the freedom that I need is the freedom from myself. And as long as I keep my eyes on Christ, as long as I focus there, well, I have a chance. So, this freedom in Christ, it means you can't have your own way. Jesus says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. And you know what? I believe he was spot on. Let's pray together. For the good and the bad and the ugly, it's part of who we are. For the genetic predispositions we have that make us strong and make us vulnerable, not just in body, but in mind and in spirit. God, we acknowledge these things today and James puts it to us with no buffer, <laughs> reminding us of just how deadly selfishness is, of just how completely greed and pride suck the life out of us. And so help us to hear the words, to be mindful of our history with gratitude for those who did the best they could, with a, a willingness to repent, not just for sins of the past, but for how we continue to commit those sins today trusting in forgiveness, but most especially celebrating the joy of the freedom that we know. These things we pray in the name of the crucified and risen Christ. Amen. Before we continue with prayers, um, I'd like to invite the youth down to Sunday school. If you're in sixth through 12th grade, you can join Sarah down in my office and talk a little bit about the sermon. So youth Sunday school today, if you're up for that, right down to my office. All right, happy chatting. We do have prayers to lift up this morning. So I invite us into prayer as we lift up the joys and concerns that were shared with us. Prayers be with my friends at Oxford, Florida, Assembly of God, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Alabama, and Hebrew, Hebron Lutheran Church in Virginia as they worship God this morning. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Harold Lemna and family. Harold is Bob's younger brother, and we pray for you as Harold passed this week. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for those who are struggling with the suicide of loved ones. Comfort in their grief. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for Katie and Dan, who were married yesterday, granddaughter of Bruce and Lil. How wonderful. Lord, in your mercy. A prayer of gratitude for a loving connection and prayers of comfort in grief. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers for a friend who has been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Lord, in your mercy. Prayers of comfort for Gus and healing from surgery. 
Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for all high school athletes. We celebrate their accomplishments and we pray for their safety. Lord, in your mercy. Oh, beloved God, we lift up these many things that we've prayed aloud this morning, acknowledging that there are so many others, things that are joy-filled, things that we have great gratitude for, as well as things that weigh us, weigh our hearts down, bring us sorrow and sadness. We pray for your mercy, your healing, your comfort in all of these things. We pray all of this using the words that you taught us so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, at this time, we bring forward our morning offering. This is a time for us to give back from our resources. This is a time for us to support our church, God's ministry in this world. We give now so that the stranger can be welcomed in, so that those who are hungry can be fed. And those who need clothing can get some. Let us now bring our gifts to God. As we do so, we will sing, Lord of all hopefulness. It's on page 2197. The words are also on the screen.
History is a gift from which we can learn, a book which we can open and reflect upon, filled with blessings and trials, reminding us not just of the past, but of present opportunities, of the choices that we have to make here and now to give, to be generous, or to hold back, to risk, or to play it safe, to live with faith, or to have everything laid out for us. Thank you for the impulse in us, expressed in the founding documents of this nation, the awareness of the need to be mindful of the few. Regardless of how we behave, we are grateful for that word and in our scriptures for the good news that guilt need not tie us down. That we are free to love, free to give, free to forgive. The offering that we bring forward today is symbolic of all of that. It represents time, and effort, and energy, the use of skills. It represents faith in what we can do and in what you can do in us and through us. And so we say thank you. As we give, we say thank you and we pray your blessing not only on the gift, but on the giver. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. I have two announcements, and I know Rachel has at least one or two, <clears throat> and Adam has one. So my two. This afternoon from 2 to 5, the Bishop, uh, Bishop Devadar is on the Vermont District. He is in Shelburne. The theme for the day is missions. And I know Rachel will be uh, offering one of the presentations. I'll be there for a portion of that day, but everyone is welcome. This is at Shelburne United Methodist Church from 2 to 5 this afternoon. Uh, second announcement is this week on Thursday, we received the resignation of our custodian, Jesse Schilling. He's not leaving mad. He's leaving because he's got a, a good job opportunity. <laughs> and so we celebrate that with him. Uh, he'll be with us for another couple of weeks. Um, as you can imagine, getting that on Thursday, that began a mad dash to figure out, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Because the custodian does a lot of stuff that a lot of people don't know. I mean, we complain about him, but he does a lot of stuff we don't know. <laughs> Church is warm on Sunday morning. It's because Jesse was here on Saturday night. And so, anyway, uh, keep us in prayer as we think about this, how we want to move forward. We have options and uh, Pam Fenimore, our administrative assistant, she is on this like a rat on a Cheeto. I mean, she's on this. And so uh, we are making progress, um, thinking about how, what we're going to do, and Staff Parish will be uh, thinking about this as well. So those are my two announcements. Adam? I have uh, two announcements. One is Saturday evening in the sanctuary, there's going to be a fantastic choral concert by the Vermont Chamber Artists. And we have a lot of concerts in this church and they're all fantastic and not enough of you come to all of them. So Saturday, seven o'clock, be here, support music in this space and, and in this sanctuary. It's gonna be fantastic, you're gonna love it, I promise. If you don't, I'll apologize later. Um, <clears throat> but you, I won't have to. And second is that choir is going to be starting up again soon. Um, I will send emails and put in the chimes and do all the exciting things, but I think uh, September 27th, so it will be our first Thursday rehearsal. We're going to do choir this year like we did last year because I think it worked pretty well. So we're going to do it in chunks. So we haven't started this week or next week as we had in the past. We're going to start in a few weeks. We're going to rehearse a bunch for about four weeks and we'll sing a bunch of times and then we'll take a few weeks off and we'll come back for round two sometime in Advent and Christmas and then we'll take some time off. So if you feel like, hey, I'd love to sing with the choir but I just, I can't come to rehearsal every Thursday for a year, don't worry about it.
come on the 27th. Uh, and if you can't do that one, come the next time. You know, if you can commit to just a few weeks at a time, that's what we're doing. It seems like we're getting more um, participation that way. So if you have questions about specifically, like what are the dates and times and commitments, come talk to me. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. But um, it's starting soon, and I'd love to have as many people participate in the music program as possible. Thanks. And on the note of everything getting started again, Sunday school's up and running again, and youth group starts up this Tuesday. We've got a college brunch at the end of this month, the last, uh, in fact, I'm thinking about changing the name of, from college brunch to like young adult brunch, so, you know, the 20-somethings. Uh, some of our college kids have, have graduated, but they want to keep brunching with us, so. I don't want to stop them. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're late teens, 20-somethings, come to brunch. Uh, so our, our first one will be at the end of this month. I think it's the 30th is the Sunday at the end of the month. Um, and uh, Rob and, and Margie have provided amazing food so that you can never go wrong with some phenomenal home-cooked food. And if you're at college, we know how much you appreciate home-cooked food on a Sunday morning. So come for that. Um, Let's see, uh, Taze gets started again. So next Sunday evening at 6.30, we'll have, uh, we'll have the first of this year's Taze services. If you don't know what that is, um, it's this beautiful meditative experience, worship experience, uh, a lot of prayer, a lot of chanting, but you're not gonna get a sermon. Um, you'll hear a little bit of scripture, but this is really about time to sit and reflect. In fact, the presentation I'm giving today at the Bishop's Day uh, thing in a, in a few hours, I'll be talking about how Taze, it's kind of like taking a breath, sitting still, and letting God hold you for a little while. And that's kind of how I experience it. So I, I invite you to experience sitting still and letting God hold on to you just for a little while. It's, it's just a wonderful feeling. Um, so that starts next week. It'll be the third Sunday of each month uh, during the school year, our Taze services. Uh, and the last thing is uh, a, a number of us from this church have been invited to participate in the fire truck poll. If you're not familiar with Outright Vermont, they help uh, young people in our area who identify as, uh, as lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, questioning. And a number of us have been invited to be on a team um, by, you know, Tim and Linda Looney, who aren't here today. Their grandchild has invited a pile of us, and how do you say no to that? So in a few weeks, we're going to be doing that. And if you'd like to sponsor us, um, come, and, come and find uh, somebody from my family. We're all going to be pulling. I know Tim Looney will be uh, part of that team as well. So you can support us as, as we help take care of what's truly a phenomenal um, outreach program in our city that we really want to support. I think those are the announcements. Uh, always a reminder to sign the prayer letters in the back after the surf. Oh, good. Thank you, Sue. Uh, there'll be a prayer letter back there for Jesse as well. Uh, Sue is letting us know. So, so you can say thank you there. That'd be great. All right. With that, we're going to go to our closing hymn, The Lone Wild Bird. It's printed on page uh, 2052 in the black hymnal Words will also be up on the screen. Let us sing.
I am yours, and you rest in me too. Great Spirit, guide us this day out into the world. Help us to be your people wherever we may find ourselves, that we might be spreading your love, offering some hope and some comfort and forgiveness wherever we might go, and acknowledging that when we are free in you, we are truly free. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace with one another this day.